Hello Lazio all over the world, welcome to another episode of Lazio Lounge. I'm Vittorio Campanile here. We have to talk about Lazio Spezia. Lazio's back, uh, important win, and I would say that Lazio played so well that avoided the Alistair curse, right? Because you were at the stadium again, and even with that, Lazio managed to win comfortably, even though we missed a penalty, right? Um, yeah. What well, <laughs> you know, the, the the Alistair curse isn't really happening this season. I have to say, I'm just <laughs> going to def- defend myself for a second here. I think um, we what we beat Inter when I was there. We beat Bologna when I was there. We beat Verona when I was there. So I don't know, Vittorio. It's it's shaky now. Your theory, your conspiracy. Well, we are playing so well, so much better than uh, your curse doesn't work anymore. That's the. <laughs> Oh, well, we, win, we win, it, win every game 4 0 now, apparently. Last three match, 10 goals and zero allowed. I don't know which number it's most surprising, Alistair. 10 goals scored or non conceded? <laughs> Probably the latter. I mean, yeah, the. It, it does feel like it's coming together, doesn't it? Like, there, there's, um, there's obviously. Uh, a slight asterisk, I guess, next to the opposition. But then again, um, Lazio have had issues with with mid-table, lower-table opposition plenty of times in the past. So I don't think it necessarily is something that you you can ever take for granted. Certainly not to be winning these games um, 4-0. But last season, Lazio didn't have any issues scoring goals. We know that. Second top scorers in the league last season. But Combining that now with a defense that's not giving much away is um, is suddenly making this team look pretty tasty. Um, I mean, yesterday was honestly one of the most comfortable days I think I've had watching Lazio at the Olimpico. It, it was really never in doubt. Even after Chiro missed the penalty, it felt pretty comfortable from start to finish. Spezia had a chance there before we scored, right? With Lazzari saving it on the line, pretty much. I think that was yeah. the biggest chance they, they had. I mean, if they scored there, it, it would have been a different match. But I have to think that, I have to say that after the penalty Chiro missed after just one minute, I thought, oh my God, this can really go the wrong way. And we saw it so often, Alistair, in the past. Things going badly after a big chance wasted. You said Lazio keep playing like nothing happened. And I really like that that mentality, right? Yeah, I mean it's um it's relentless. Yeah, it's relentless. And I but I think that's that's just um the result of the way the team is playing. Because it feel they feel a lot slicker now, uh, a lot more fluid in the way they're moving the ball around, the way they're able to soak up pressure the speed and accuracy with which they're moving the ball from from back to front has improved a lot. Um, And yesterday was just really a case of actually, I think, tactically getting it spot on. I was a little bit unsure before the match. I mean, I've watched Spezia a couple of times this season before yesterday and thought they looked pretty well organized, um, playing with a kind of back five. Gotti tends to use the same team over and over again as well. So they know exactly what they're doing by this point. And so it did surprise me how poor they were in, in an organizational sense. But actually, I think Lazio created that. And the, the way that Lazio overloaded in wide areas, I thought the wingers had great games yesterday, uh, both Sakanya and Anderson. But I think the way that Lazio created those spaces it was amazing how often there would just be a huge gaping hole in the middle of the pitch but that was a result of the way that Lazio were moving the ball and the way they were stretching that defense and forcing defenders out of out of position um so yeah I think Spezia were poor but Lazio I think seemed to kind of get everything right yesterday (laughs) and and definitely I think tactically um tactically they did too as well I know a lot of people will say, well, Spezia is not a great team. Spezia is just one point behind Fiorentina. So, yeah, Fiorentina is not playing as a lot of other expected. But still, Spezia is 11, 12 on the table. So that's not bad. I mean, it's it's not an easy team. So that's one thing. The second, Alistair, 
how surprised and how much does this tells you that fans are concerned about Patrick's condition? We have Diana Putra 3 <laughs> asking any information about Patrick's condition. Bit worrying considering the busy schedule in the coming weeks. I mean, a couple of years ago, people would have been <laughs> happy that Patrick was injured. And now we are scared. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, I... Uh... I was just cracking up yesterday. The the guy in, who was sitting in front of me was just such such a big Patrick fan. Like everything he did, this guy was celebrating. You know, he was cheering his name. He, he was just screaming in support of him the whole game. And yeah, I was having the same thought. It's like the transformation this guy has had. It's some we've we've become a bit accustomed to it now. Um, but especially under Sari, the way he's been playing is. It's ridiculous, really. But no, I mean, I think there is depth there. You know, it was uh, Gila coming on, you know, wasn't wasn't all that tested, in all honesty. But there's Kazali there as well, who's clearly um, a, a guy we're, we're expecting to see more of as time goes on. And, and Romagnoli, real day to remember for him yesterday as well, getting his first goal under the Kurva. And uh, what a goal as well, <laughs> if you're going to score your first. Yeah. Um, so, no, you're right. I mean, I think that it just feels, it, it feels good. It feels together. And the fact that, yeah, you're right. I think Patrick, Patrick's improvement is something to celebrate, but I think the whole team has improved as well. And we're seeing far more of the kind of Sari fluency than now, than, than we did uh, really at any time last season, probably. Anyway, it looks like Patrick had too much breakfast and uh, felt a little bit sick in the in the first half so that's why he's got sub nothing uh, to concern nothing to worry he should be fit for thursday and uh, what can we say about uh, uh, romagnoli's word this is a shirt that we'll remember scoring the first time in front of vittorio what a celebration right? <laughs> yeah it was nice i mean as the the kind of way that uh, he had cataldi beside him as well you know arm around the shoulders it's too to Laziale, um, you know, boyhood fans of the club there together celebrating. And you, you don't you don't always need that, but it definitely gives it something extra. And especially in this team that is, they're not there for the sake of being there. You know, they're not just guys who have been boosted in to provide, a, um, you know, just a bit of that Lazialita um, in, in this team. It's that there are key players in this team. And, I think it's really creating a buzz now. Um, it was it's something I was thinking about yesterday in, in the ground. And it's not just that the, the crowds are a lot bigger this season than they were last, which we've discussed the reasons before about that. I just think the whole thing, if, do you not think it, it feels like there's a lot more enthusiasm this season than last? It feels like there's a lot more kind of confidence and belief and a connection in this team in a way that I've not felt since that 1920 season where we were flying and it was interrupted by COVID. But that the connection between kind of fan and players and, and the match day experience and stuff is is feeling now like it did then almost. Um, not quite the same level of excitement because obviously no one's involved in a Scudetto battle yet, but it's it's got the same kind of feeling to it. I think the fact that Lazio's playing so well has an impact. I mean, the player, the players definitely enjoy playing, and you can see it. But you know, when they're playing with with uh, enjoyment, like like they are now, even the fans feel it, and uh, they feel part of it, and they enjoy going to the stadium. So I think that's is all together. And uh, I don't know, Alasdor. I saw all the other teams playing. And Milan and Napoli are probably the only team playing better than Lazio. Um, Inter is struggling. Roma have won, but without playing amazing football at all. Same thing about Juventus. I'm not saying we are Scudetto contenders. Don't get me wrong. But we are, playing, <laughs> we are playing very well. We are playing probably after, Inter, after Napoli and Milan. The best football in Serie A. Yeah, and I think that that definitely you're right. That does that feeds into the this enthusiasm and atmosphere and so on because 
people like watching good football and at times this has been some of the best football we've seen uh last year play for years and and it's it's kind of uh you know it's it's the result of giving this a bit of time and a bit of patience um because it wasn't always like that last season under Sari yeah, and really there were a lot of difficulties and I think also as well a, a lot of the kind of excitement is around the feeling that there's more to come from this team because yeah like playing very well at the moment scoring a lot of goals there's creativity all over this team there's good depth in this team but there definitely is a feeling that there's more more to come because Cancellieri we've still not seen much of Luca Romero we've still not seen much of Marcos Antonio came on and I thought he just looked so slick yesterday when he came on and yeah okay it's a fairly easy job I guess you're four nil up or three nil up against a team and you're in the centre mid but I he's another player like him like Casale you know there's there are options there who I still feel like have a lot of talent um a lot of potential who we've still not really seen um be a part of this this exciting Lazio team so yeah I think there's yeah. excitement about the present but also about the future yeah, I really like Marcos Antonio, and uh, every time he come in, he always looked good, I would say. So, I don't know if he's going to start in Europe League. We saw that Sari do, does more turnover this year than in the past. But another player we didn't mention, Alistair, is his eye. I mean, again, yesterday, he played really well. Uh, yeah, the match was probably over, but he came in. And defended well, attacked when he had the chance. And at the same time, it was positive, or at least for me, it was positive to see both Chiro and Lazzari going out in the second half, not the last minutes of the second half. And uh, we know both players were coming back from injury. Uh, Chiro played every second so far in Serie A. So that was the first time he was subbed. I think it's very important because... It's going to be a very long season and we need to rest the key players like Chiron Lazzari. Agreed. Yeah. I mean, that was, that was one of the real big talking points going into this game, wasn't it? Whether, yeah. whether go with Chiro or not. I mean, it was a bit of a disaster, really. The um, international break, having Chiro with the Italy camp, uh, getting it, getting a fitness problem um, almost immediately. And uh yeah, I think that there were probably a lot of worried Lazio fans around at that point when the reports of an injury started coming around. And I I think that, you know, it could work out as being a blessing in disguise if, if he's OK and he can be rested because it was a reminder. You know, if we can get away with Chiro's actually fine I and mean, he does seem to be OK. Uh, I think just the worry that 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 caused that international break and and the the potential of an injury to Chiro is enough to rem remind everybody that we're not really prepared for that absence. So it's interesting. I thought yesterday seeing that the plan B does still seem to be Anderson as a kind of false nine, um, which didn't surprise me all that much. But I do think if we're gonna if we're going to try and use Cancellieri there at some point, we need to start trying to use Cancellieri there probably, I don't know, on Thursday, do you think? Is that too soon? I mean, I, I think we're probably a bit wary at this point of being too experimental in the Europa League, but if it's not there, then where is it that we're going to try it? Yeah, honestly, I was surprised that Cancellieri didn't come in. I understand that Pedro has experience. Uh, he's an important guy. I think he came in when we were still to kneel up, probably. So maybe that's one of the reasons why he didn't want to risk Cancellieri. But again, I mean, when are we going to test him? Uh, we need to win Thursday. It's very, very important for us that we win the Thursday. Um, so he's never going to start, right, in Europe League, or at least not now. So again, I think after the Magitlan game as well, I think Sarri's probably going to be a bit, a uh, bit more cautious than he was ever intending to be in the Europa League because that was a real, uh, <laughs> a real reminder of the fact that you don't, you're not going to get easy games on these Thursday nights. 
um, no. in this group. And he did try and rotate that night. And that was the result, was an absolute humiliation. But but he rotated even against Feyenoord. So I don't think that's that's the issue. And by the way, I just check. Uh, Pedro came in after the third goal. So uh, there's no excuse there. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we have to be positive that Chile Mobile came out at the 64th minute of the match. So quite early. But, I mean, we were all, all hoping to see Cancelier or Luca Romero coming in earlier and said they didn't play. Don't think they're going to start on Thursday. But, you know, rotate someone else. Maybe Marcos Antonio could start. What do you think about that? Yeah, I'd like to see that. I think it's about time, to be honest. Um, I, I don't really know enough about the, the Stormgrads team, you know, what their makeup is. Um, because... I guess that Sari's probably a bit more um, hesitant to use Marcos Antonio if it's going to be an incredibly physical match simply because the guy is, well, he's tiny. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he's very good baller, fantastic feet, um, very tidy on the ball, but uh, he's not going to throw himself about the pitch and get stuck into challenges knocking uh, big Austrian men over if that's the way that they play. I'm not sure. Uh, so, yeah, I don't know. It depends, I guess, on how they think the best approach to that game is. But I think Cataldi's been playing pretty well in while we're waiting for him, I guess. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. It's, it, it feels like the size thing is, is too simple because they, they knew what size he was before they signed him. So it, it can't be a surprise if he turns up at Formello one day and, you know, he's five foot six or however tall he is because they'll have had his dimensions, you would have thought. It's like a, a wish, right? You buy things on wish and then you find something else. Hey, <laughs> what happened? No, I, I don't know. I think the only issue is that Sari wants to be sure that he is aware of all the movement he has to make, the position, the tactical side. Uh, obviously, that's a very important position for Maurizio Sarri. But every time he plays, I, I think he's, he's a talent. He's very good. Uh, even yesterday, he came in and don't remember Spezia creating nothing. So, yeah, I would love to test him a little bit more. So, I don't know, maybe the second half next Thursday. Don't know how much. I actually, yeah, go I actually, I, I actually scribbled down a team I would like to see on Thursday. Do you want to hear it? Yeah, go for it. So, I went with Maximiano in goal. Wow. Uh, a back four of Hussai, Romagnoli, Gila, and Marisic. A midfield of Alberto, Antonio, and Vecino. And then a front three of Anderson, Pedro, and Cancellieri. Wow. So I think that's like a balance of keeping a very familiar core to the team, I guess, with, you know, Alberto, Anderson, uh, Romagnoli, Marisic but then actually giving time to some of the guys who I feel like probably need it and could do with the opportunity. Um, and Mac Maximiano, I really think, should be given an opportunity at some point. Um, Provadel's been fantastic, don't get me wrong. I mean, again, yesterday, he, made, he hardly had anything to do, and then at the end, he made a really good save. Um, but... Maximiano, let's not forget, I mean, he had a nightmare of a debut, but he was brought in to be the first choice. He did start the season as the first choice. He must be a good goalkeeper. And uh, I think the Europa League is an obvious place to, to give him an opportunity to, to show what he can do. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Honestly, I was surprised that he didn't start against Midtjylland. That was a little bit concerning. I thought that was the perfect match. Just as uh, well. I mean, that wouldn't have been a great uh, <laughs> no. record for him if it was Bologna and then that game. <laughs> well, who knows? Maybe he would have stopped all those goals and uh, he would have been the hero of the match. We don't know. But yeah, uh, we have to say that last week, rumors came out of uh, Lazio thinking to send on loan Maximiano in January. I don't believe these rumors at all. I thought it I think it would be so silly to do that. So I don't believe it. But just to let you know the atmosphere uh, in which Maximiano is living, um, I don't think it's going to happen. And I hope Sarri is going to give him a chance in Europe League. 
So maybe this Thursday is going to be the right match. Even though maybe it's better to have a debut at home instead of an away match. But still, I think he needs to start somewhere. Do you think the fact that it's Fiorentina next makes it like clear that we will see a bit of rotation? Because that's, that's clearly quite an important game, uh, Fiorentina. And we've the, the Storm, Storm Graz game should be, I think, on paper, given that they're bottom seeds, the easiest we're going to get. But this Europa League group makes no sense because no. they beat they beat Magitland, then Magitland hammered Lazio, Lazio hammered Feyenoord, and then Feyenoord hammered Storm Graz. So like none of the results make any sense, and I have no idea how good anyone is basically. <laughs> no, no. Yeah, I was surprised to see Storm Graz winning the first match of the of the of the tournament so maybe that was a surprise i guess we're gonna see rotation i mean you have to do it uh one thing important is finally and i think this is the first time Lazio is gonna play on monday after the europe league so mm -hmm. we're gonna finally have enough rest for this match but yeah i, I think that a little bit turnover uh, sari has to do it as he did, did against feyenoord and against uh, Michelin. Obviously, we don't have Casale. He's injured. But I think apart from that, he's going to rotate as much as possible, obviously. Don't expect 11 new players, but I think five could be a valuable, correct number of, of changes. Yeah, I think so. I think that's that's kind of what I was, what I was feeling. Um, you probably need to give that team assemblance of identity as being the same, you know, fam familiar enough core to the team, at least, that it's not going to completely disorientate everyone. Um, because I think that was a bit of a problem with the Magitlan game is, yeah, okay, maybe they rotated against Feyenoord as well, but there, I think the fact that we had, like, Hussain Radu as fullbacks for the first time this season, and that completely changes the, the, the makeup of the defence, for example. Hmm. Um... <clears throat> just looking at questions we had again, I mean, one of the ones I thought was quite interesting was from Philip Pizzano just saying, are we playing like a big team now? Mm. I guess you can interpret that in any way you want. But <laughs> <laughs> Well, we're, as I said at the beginning, we're playing great football, honestly. Uh, watching all the other matches, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat, Napoli and Milan are, are the only team who have been playing better football than Lazio so far. So I don't know if that's big team football but we're definitely playing enjoyable football even for not last of fun and at the same time maybe people would say well even last year you were playing good football but we were conceding a lot this year it's much it's completely different right uh we are not conceding that much and we're still scoring a lot so that's that's really encouraging obviously we played against verona cremonese and spezia but last year we struggled against this team. So probably next Monday is going to be a bigger test. But let's not forget that we beat Inter anyway. So it's not that we played only against small teams so far. Inter still a big team. <laughs> of course they are. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think for me, the idea of playing like a big team is, is tied to mentality, really. It's tied to having that um, the confidence, I guess, that you're going to you're going to win these games no matter how things are going that you're going to beat opposition if it's uh, if it especially if it's mid to lower table opposition um and that confidence and the mentality question is something that's come up so often uh with Lazio um yeah. in the last few years i have a bit of a theory about this um that i want to present to you though because i think it's really interesting what's been happening with inter this season under inzaghi and I think there's a lot of parallels between the way that they're playing and the problems that they're having and issues that we saw in Inzaghi's time at Lazio. And I th I think that we've we discussed this already back back at that time, but there is a certain like the the manic kind of franticness to Inzaghi's energy on the side of the pitch. And the way that that does not resonate calmness to his players. And I think we loved it, you know, at times, you know, the fact that he's running down the pitch, joining in the celebrations. He's basically on the pitch half the time. The fourth official is always holding him back and he's a big character. He's clearly passionate 
and it was a big part of kind of what what Lazio fans loved about Inzaghi. But I I do wonder how helpful that is to the team at the time, especially if it's that level of micromanagement where he's always there, he's always communicating, and his his emotions are so high and on on edge all the time. And I, I can't help but feel that that perhaps translated to the players a bit to make them perform in a bit more of a frantic way. And and when there were all these ups and downs and blackout moments and uh, mental collapses in games, if there's a connection there or not. And I, I don't think we're seeing that that kind of level of extreme up and down with Inter, but there does seem to be a bit of an issue with them in terms of having that confidence and that, yeah, that projection of being a big team in, in some of these matches. And, and playing the game their way. And I think that perhaps is something that's changed a little bit, certainly this season under under Sari. It was something Sari was really frustrated about when he first arrived was what is going on with the mentality of this team? Why do they switch off in these games? Why do they, uh, you know, play amazing on the weekend and then the, the next match, a few days later, they'll be terrible? And I think it's something we've seen he's, he, he's, he's really worked at trying to sort out. And then it happened again, obviously, against Magitlan. So he hasn't sorted it out. But I don't know. I just, I, I do wonder if there's a connection there between Inzaghi's style and the result he gets from his players. I don't know. What do you think? Well, for a second, I thought that was in an Inter podcast. I thought, well, I got the wrong link. <laughs> but. I don't know. I don't think that players are so inexperienced that if you see a manager um, micromanaging like Inzaghi does, uh, create you issue like that. Um, I think Inter is paying a little bit the fact that some players were overhyped. I mean, let's not forget that last year people were thinking that Barella was better than Mini Kristavic. I mean, this is a unbelievable thing right but at a certain point Gazeta Sport was convinced that Barella was better than Miniko Isavic um Skriniar is a good central defender but he's not playing at the same level before as before um you know I think there are some players that are not at the right level and are were considered much better than than before than they really are uh, to add to this, we have to say that Inter lost, but it's not that Roma dominated the match. I mean, uh, Andanovic has huge responsibility in the first goal. And in the second one, the defense didn't mark well. So, uh, it's strange because Inzaghi, one year ago, was the best manager in Italy. And now, suddenly, he's the worst one. I mean, you should have a little bit of balance, right? So... Don't think you can blame Inzaghi for everything. We know him very well. You know, we know that if you get a yellow card, you get sub. You know that at the end of the match, he's gonna say, even if he lose, I don't remember a save from my goalkeeper. But I don't think he's playing. He's that bad manager. I mean, I I still don't like how Roma plays. They won, but they have been lucky in a certain way, right? So don't know. I think the, it's the mentality of the players because they come, they play. It's not the manager. Mm. Yeah, no, no, I, I, I definitely agree that I don't think it's all it's all in Zaggy's fault. I just think um, I was just when I was watching him, I was I was thinking again about that because we've discussed that in the past, that franticness, and if that that translates or not onto the pitch. Um, but anyway, um, enough about Inter and Inzaghi. <laughs> I think off what, the pitch, what? one of the things worth mentioning is this dedication of the Curva Sud to, to Maestrelli, which happened yesterday, which was very nice. I don't know if you want to explain that to people who, who didn't hear about it. Well, basically, uh, there are two things to, to say. The first one is that finally this season, Lazio will open the Curva Sud that now will be called forever Curva Maestrelli. So in the past... I don't know for which reason Lazio didn't want to open the Curva Sud. So you were forced to go or in Tevere or in Tribuna Montemario. Uh, now they decide that thanks to the season tickets, we reached 29,000, I think. And in fact, yesterday we were 41, something like that, at the stadium. 
they decide to open every every game, home game, the Curva Mestrelli, who has been uh, dedicated to the former Lazio uh, manager, the manager who won the first Scudetto, and the were the nephew, I think, of Maestrelli there at the celebration, at the inauguration, which is good. I mean, I, I'm liking this type of approach uh, of uh, the of Lazio now, going back, uh, not bringing Lazio fan inside the club because they didn't, but at least celebrating Lazio legend a little bit more, like Tommaso Maestrelli and things like that. So that's good, added to the fact that, you know, now with the, 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 the Stadio Olimpico is much better than last year, where it was pretty much all the time empty. Now, even against Spezia, we were 41,000, so that's that's an improvement, and I think this will help the team. And so far, we saw it, right? Last year at home, lost only against Napoli, so that's that's a positive sign overall. Yeah, I, I, I hope they keep the banner there in games where it's not going to be filled as well, actually. Yeah. That would be quite cool, having that the banner of Maestrelli just uh, covering the empty seats. Um, yeah, I mean, the, about the crowd, yeah, that was one of the other questions we got from Tom was about how big a role does the size and enthusiasm of the crowd play in, in Lazio's performances. I, I, I think it's massive. I mean, the, the players have talked about this over and over again, really. Whenever there is a big crowd or a big performance, it's something that is mentioned. And actually, when there wasn't last season at times, um, I remember Cherby talking about it. I think Milinkovic Savage talked about it. Um, it can have the opposite effect. I mean, we know, you know, with we were saying at times last season, it felt like we were the only ones in the stadium. And it is a depressing thing. You know, it's it's an enormous yeah. grind, the Olympico, 70,000 seats in there. So if you've only got a crowd of 6,000 going to watch a, a game on a Thursday night, of course, that's going to sap some of the energy and enthusiasm from the players. So, yeah, definitely. I think it, it makes a massive difference um, because, yeah, 40,000 may not be... Uh, anywhere near capacity but if you actually hear the noise created by 40,000 Lazioli it's it's pretty significant so um I think it definitely makes a difference no definitely definitely and uh, you know it's important uh for, for the players now this doesn't mean that Lazio will win every home game let's think about Saturday as uh, San Siro was sold out and Inter lost so it is you don't have the guarantee but definitely you have the support of the fans and um, it's one of the most important thing Alistair, i would say that it's how we were mentioning patrick before right how things change for patrick but i would say how things change for lazio as well before big part of the fans were against the club and they were creating problems you know uh, booing the, the owner booing the, the manager and things like that. A lot of players have been booed, uh, not only Acerbi. Now, it, it's completely different. It's completely different. Fans love Sarri. Fans are uh, encouraging players, even when they make mistakes. Um, let's not think about Maximiliano. Uh, Patrick is another example. So that's, that's really a positive sign. I mean, it looks like if before we felt that there was a negative feelings around Lazio, now things have changed. It's positive feelings when you go to the stadium. So that's, I, I feel it, and I guess even the fan, the players feel it. So they play much better than they would have done before. Yeah, and like like you say as well, you said right at the start, the the better the atmosphere, the more. Uh, the better a day out it becomes and therefore the more people want to go um because it's it, it, it is hard to convince someone to go watch yeah. a game with you if if it's a crap spectacle rubbish atmosphere whatever but at the moment it's just a great day out because it's full of color full of noise um last year i've started doing a few things before the game to try and like generate a bit of atmosphere and um yeah i think it's 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 a huge huge improvement from last season last season was pretty depressing at times in terms of the match day experience so that that is something the club deserves a little bit of credit for as i'd say you, you know what it reminds me a little bit of when zenek zeman came to lazio the first year the fans were really 
uh, enjoying it and they were really looking forward for every single home game of Lazio and um, you can feel the passion you can feel the excitement it was enjoyable watching the first year especially of Zeman's uh, managing Lazio Lazio would score a lot of goals a lot of matches finishing 6-1 5-1 etc um, I think there's a little bit the same thing this year with Sarri we won a lot of matches we play very good football most of the time so it's overall enjoyable we can say that the olympico is not the best stadium in the world that most of the time you have to go home and re-watch the match to understand what happened i mean when romagnoli scored i thought it was Milinko Saric, so i had to go to the zone and watch it again yeah. but you know <laughs> apart from that it's, it's fun yeah, definitely. Uh, I was on the other side of the stadium from you as well, so I was even further away. And uh, when the goal went in, everyone was kind of celebrating and then it went a little bit quiet and everyone was kind of trying to work out who it was. Yeah, yeah. Like one person just goes, Romagnoli, and then everyone's like, oh, Romagnoli, Romagnoli, oh, great. <laughs> nobody has a clue <laughs> yeah, it's terrible. what's actually happened. But yeah, anyway, no, absolutely positive, that stuff. Anyway, Alison. 299. Do you know what number it is? 299. Uh, I don't know. Give me a clue. The minutes has passed from last goal, uh, last goal conceded in Serie A. Oh, wow. So you're coming in hot with the big stats to finish today, are you? <laughs> yeah. Last goal. That's, last that's, goal. that's impressive. 299. Oh, oh. Lazio last goal considered was Lazio Napoli 61st minute uh Cavascheria score after that there is Lazio Verona Lazio Cremonese and Lazio Spezia 10 goals scored non considered three clean sheet I mean <laughs> I didn't expect to say that this season the plan was that if you concede enough in Denmark that like takes up all the goals conceded for the month so we can just do one really bad game a month, concede all the goals for that month, and then the rest will be clean sheets. It's clever. I mean, what did Mourinho say? It's better to lose one match for nil than for one nil, right? And we take the <laughs> Mourinho's word. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He didn't realize he was talking about Lazio, but he <laughs> no, definitely not. But yeah, I mean, we are same points of Milan ahead of Juve, Roma, Inter. Um, do you know, though, uh, I just saw this before we came on. Do you know how this compares to last season? In terms of how many points we've got? More than last season. Uh, I think uh, like four or five. Only three. Oh, wow. Yeah, it surprised me a little bit. But I guess yeah. you have to remember the draws with Samp and Torino were a bit disappointing. But, um, yeah, three points better off than last season. So, that, I mean, that that is good after... What eight games, seven games? Yeah, eight, eight games. Ten in total, considering the two in Europe League, but eight games in the season. This means that Inter, Juventus, uh, and Roma have done less points, more or less, a lot of less points compared to last season, probably. Yeah, I don't have those numbers to hand, but I imagine, yeah. Okay. Well, I think this is a uh, we live with good stats, right? Uh, encouraging signs. Now we have stone graphs just to bring us back on earth, right? <laughs> uh, I hope not, but yeah. um, God, anything can happen. Let, at least we'll, we'll be not taking Thursday nights for granted anymore. So let's hope we get through this one um, with a good result and a little bit of rotation. That'd be perfect. Yeah, 6.45 kickoff, Central European time. Let's not forget about that. Otherwise, you turn on the TV at nine o'clock and say, "Hey, it's finished. Where is it?" Six forty-five kickoff. Uh, thanks again, Alistair, for joining me. Thanks everybody for listening. Remember, you can follow us wherever you listen to your podcast, even on YouTube, uh, Spreaker, etc. And uh, if you like the channel, you can support us on Patreon.com/slash Lazio Lounge. Membership starts at two dollars a month. And we're going to be back as soon as possible, probably after Lazio Fiorentina Lazio, I guess. Thanks, Alistair. Cheers. Ciao, ciao.